Let's take our Bibles and look together to begin with in Jeremiah chapter 47. And it's a short chapter, but a very powerful one when we consider these words of the Lord to Jeremiah. We began last time a series of prophecies that were being addressed to other than just the tribe of Judah and the woes that had come upon Judah. Here, last time we saw the woes to Egypt. And now in this chapter, 47, we see God's prophecy against the Philistines. And here in verse 1, we see the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. Notice how all these chapters begin with that. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. It's not Jeremiah's word. It's the word of the Lord through Jeremiah. That's what it is to be a faithful preacher. So he delivers it. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah, the prophet. He was God's prophet, whether people acknowledged him or not. And this was against the Philistines before that Pharaoh smote Gaza. We saw last time how the Lord raised up Nebuchadnezzar to go against Pharaoh. But here we see that there was a time when the Lord had raised up the Pharaoh of Egypt. And that's the title of the leader of Egypt. This is not the same Pharaoh that was alive when Moses brought the children of Israel out, but it was the same lineage of kings in Egypt that continued on according to God's direction. And when it says before Pharaoh attacked Gaza, this just shows that the prophecy was given actually before this calamity actual, actually came upon Gaza. A lot of people that don't believe that this is the inspired word of God, they think, well, this must have been written after the fact. But no, it was pronounced very clearly here before that Pharaoh smote Gaza. And Gaza was a city, a significant city there in Philistia, that part of even today, the Gaza Strip. You hear about that in the news. There's still conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. But before Pharaoh attacked Gaza, that attack probably occurred somewhere around 609 before Christ, if you look at it historically. In fact, in verse 1, the reference to Pharaoh, that campaign that he did, it was actually to prop up a tottering Assyria at that time against Babylon. And so he went to war. And at that time, there was a struggle in the balance of power, which has continued all down through these years. That's still going on over there today. But here is where we read the judgment. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, waters rise up out of the north. So this is a way of speaking metaphorically of the Babylonians that when they came, they would not only come to conquer Judah and the Egyptians, but they would extend their rule throughout this entire region as part of their empire. So that's what it means here when it says, behold, waters rise up out of the north. That's where Babylon was in relationship to these other countries. And they would come in when it says rise up out of the north and shall be an overflowing flood. It's describing then an overwhelming force that would come in against the Philistines just like floodwaters overwhelm a land. And here it says shall overflow the land and all that is therein the city and them that dwell therein. 
So this is not just a judgment against the land, but the very people of the land. Then the men shall cry, and all the inhabitants of the land shall howl. A very descriptive way of talking about the sounds of conquest. These are war sounds, the cries that go up, people wailing. And here it says in verse 3, the noise of the stamping of the hooves of his strong horses at the rushing of his chariots and at the rumbling of his wheels. The fathers shall not look back to their children for feebleness of hands. That's an amazing thing. So frightened would be even the fathers that they would be seeking to save themselves and wouldn't even consider the children that they're leaving behind as they flee. I don't know how to judge this sort of noise of horses, hooves, and chariots. I think Hollywood tried to depict it a little bit with Ben-Hur and the sounds that they have of, of the noise of, of the wheels, but to actually hear the sound of the hooves coming from a distance, that's what's being described here. These were sounds of judgment coming upon the Philistines. And the uh, book of Revelation uses horses to describe judgments that the Lord has brought upon the world. A lot of people see it as still future at some period of time, but as the Lord has directed me in understanding the word, these are judgments that God is bringing even now on this world. We're not awaiting some judgments to come that the people look at where's the the white horse and the red horse and the black horse all of those depict judgments of God and famines and war disease and other things that God has brought and does bring just like here a lot of preachers will take this portion and try to relate it to some future event we're studying history because God is the God of history and here specifically, it describes those that were the objects of his judgments, which were the Philistines at this time. Verses four and five, this is written as a, almost as a poem, some of the metaphors, but here is the description. We saw the horses and the chariots, the wheels, the noise. But here in verses four and five, it says, because of the day that cometh to spoil all the Philistines and to cut off from Tyrus and Zidon, Tyre and Sidon, that would be in what's known today as Lebanon. Every helper that remaineth for the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. Baldness is come upon Gaza. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long wilt thou cut thyself? So here specifically, it's describing this as a day of plunder. Of all the Philistines, the Babylonians would not spare even some of the territory of these coastal people because that's who these Philistines were. They actually... When it says Kaftor there, that's Crete, the Isle of Crete. These are ones that had escaped from the Isle of Crete and come over to this part of, the, of the, the portion of Palestine that was there. And yet, whatever they sought to escape from Crete, and that would have been uh, for various reasons that the Lord moved them, that even here, it says, the Lord will spoil the Philistines, the remnant of the country of Kaftor. How many people have escaped from, from one country because of warfare or famine, gone into another country thinking that somehow they're safe and then death finds them there. It just shows us that God is sovereign in all that he does and all that he directs, whether it's the salvation of sinners, sometimes he'll move some, if they're his elect, they'll, he'll, they'll move, he'll move them to where they can be sitting under the gospel. But others, 
they escape thinking they're going to spare their lives and then they're ultimately killed, cut off. And that's really why it's speaking here of Tyre and Sidon, to cut off from Tyre and Sidon every helper. Nebuchadnezzar would conquer these great cities as well as Kaftor, Gaza, and Ashkelon. But here the Philistines are called the remnant of the country of Kaftor. And uh, as I said, that's an Old Testament description of Crete, the land from which the Philistines came originally. Describes their baldness, verse 5, has come upon Gaza. That's a sign or a token of sorrow in many countries. If, if you're mourning, then you shave your head. So here's another way of just describing the deep mourning and sorrow that this would bring. And it says there that Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. Ashkelon, this goes all the way back to the Anakims. This would have been all the way back to Goliath's people. These were people that were considered to be giants in the land. They happened to be particularly tall people, were a formidable race at that time, ones that people feared. You remember that they were the ones that were in the land when the spies went in back in the day of Moses. And when the spies came back, they said that the people were too strong or too great and uh, too tall. These would have been the sons of Anak. And uh, they would have been from this particular part of the people, fearful people. In fact, when they gave the report after having been in the land, they said that it seemed that the other people of the land were but mere grasshoppers in comparison to these people. But Moses, even then, exhorted them not to fear them. But as we know, unbelief is a strong snare, and because of that, they did not enter in. But here, no matter how prominent any of these were, as far as warriors and as people that were considered to be very strong enemies before God, they were nothing. And that's an important thing for us to remember even today. We fear certain situations or countries or warfare and all these things, but this is God even today who's exercising his will and bringing to pass exactly what he has purposed. The power is not within men's hands. It's, it's with God himself. All his creatures live and move and have their being in him. And for those that are his, that's a comfort to know that uh, there's not anyone or anything or any power, any force that could ever do anything but what God has ordained it, even as we're seeing here. And so in verses 6 and 7, as descriptive as that is of the judgment that was to come, here... Now it uses the metaphor of the sword. O thou sword of the Lord. How long will it be ere thou be quiet? It speaks here as if the very sword of God's judgment. Coming heavily upon the Philistines. The question is addressed to the sword. When will that judgment rest and be still? And there again it's the Lord that determines it. Men strategize, they plan, they go to war, but ultimately it's the Lord that determines the outcome every time. The lot is cast in the lap, but the disposing thereof is of the Lord's, the way it's put in Proverbs. And so here we see that who is it that wields the sword? It was in men's hands there in accomplishing destruction, but it was the Lord. It's the sword of the Lord. You see what it's called there in verse 6? O, o thou sword of the Lord. And it's the Lord that has animated it. And uh, causing it to strike out 
in every direction that he will. Verse 7 says, How can it be quiet, seeing the Lord hath given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore? There hath he what? Appointed it. You can't have a stronger statement on God's sovereignty than that, that he appointed it. Why do things take place today in the world? God appointed it. There's not anything that breathes or moves but what God has appointed it. And there's none as Nebuchadnezzar learned there in Daniel 4. There's, there, there's none that can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? And again, for those of us that are the Lord's, that's a comfort. There's no evil. There's nothing that can come our way but what it comes from his hand. And, and when you think about that, that means then there really is no evil. That's what the shepherd's psalm is about, isn't it? I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so here we see the sword of the Lord used for judgment. It caused, gave me pause to think about the very sword of the Lord that pierced our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it's described there by the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 13, 7, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd and against the man that is my fellow, saith the Lord of hosts. Smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But then he says, I will turn mine hand upon the little ones. I'll gather them back in again. It was the Lord that directed that sword just as he directs any sword of man against man or God against man how can it be quiet <laughs> seeing that it is the Lord that is directing it and it will continue until he himself determines that it should be placed back in the scabbard and then stilled forever what a beautiful but short portion of scripture that sets forth God and his glory and his sovereignty even over the most ruthless of leaders and people and princes. These are all gone today. Cast into eternal condemnation. The Lord brought them across the stage of this world for a time. They acted it out exactly as God purposed it and then, then exited left. Right on out. That's the God of history. But in it all in his accomplishing his, his purpose thankful that so he so directs those that he's purposed for salvation there is that remnant for whom Christ came and paid the debt undeserving none of us deserves to be called a child of God it's all by grace but there again it's according to his purpose and his will gracious father I thank you for your word how solemn it is when we consider but how peaceful as well to know that in everything that comes to pass, it is your sovereign hand directing in it all. I pray that you would grant us, first of all, the grace to bow to whatever it is you bring our way and however it is you're directing the events of history, even in our day, to know that this is your hand. And that in the end, through it all, you do receive all of the honor and glory. And I'm thankful that you've given us a quiet place here amidst all the turmoil going on in the world and perhaps even in, in our lives. Whatever that wind, whatever that storm is that you are directing and that we have this privilege even now to quietly open your word and prayerfully hear a word from you. So I pray that you would so direct our hearts and minds and may we rejoice in who you are and who your son, the Lord Jesus Christ is. I give you all the praise and honor and glory in his precious name. Amen.